We've now talked about the intuition and the mathematics behind support vector machines, and now it's time to play a little bit in code, at least on the classification side of things. Scikit-learn actually provides a variety of different implementations for support vector machines. Uh, the interfaces differ depending upon which implementation you're looking at. In our case, we're going to focus on uh, something called SVC. This is based on a library that existed before Scikit-learn called libsvm. This is available in uh, C++ form. I'm sure that at this point there are other Python uh, interfaces other than Scikit-learn. And there are also even MATLAB uh, interfaces. So let's flip over to the code. So I've provided you with a skeleton called SVM SKEL. Uh, the imports look pretty much the same. There are a couple of new things that you haven't seen uh, before. So here's our import for SVC uh, from the uh, sklearn.svm package. And we're also going to be loading up some data in pickle format. Uh, pickle is a, a, a standard format for storing and retrieving objects from streams, including files. So let's go ahead and bring that in. The next cell here, this just generates a scatter plot uh, of the data. So the, the data we're working with, it's just artificially generated uh, data uh, that is uh, two-dimensional. The, the features are two-dimensional. And uh, as input into this particular function, you, you bring in those features and then also the uh, the predictions or, or a set of labels. These can either be the true labels or predicted labels. And, and this just generates a scatter plot uh, based on what the, uh, the, the coloring of the points is based on uh, what the, uh, the label is. The, so we'll bring that into our environment. Uh, the plot probs function here does a, a variety of things as far as dealing with uh, uh, a probability vector. So these are probabilities coming from s some predictor. Uh, and the outs, of course, is our, our true set of labels. Uh, one thing that it does is it uh, first computes a confusion matrix. Of course, in order to do that, one has to uh, apply some threshold. I'm selecting 0.5 here. Uh, and then uh, it goes about uh, doing various kinds of evaluation. So I'm printing out log loss, and then we're computing our standard, standard TPR and FPR uh, statistics and generating uh, those cumulative distributions as well as the uh, ROC plot that we're used to looking at. That'll make things go a little bit faster. Okay, so, so for loading up the data, uh, this is actually loading from the pickle file. Uh, this path, of course, you'll have to adjust depending upon where your notebook is relative to where the data are, are sitting. Um, all that's happening here is that we're opening up this uh, binary data file uh, and then uh, using pickle.load. So, so what I have previously done is stored two different NumPy objects into, the, uh, into this file. The first one was the set of features. The second one was the set of labels. So, so when, you, when you execute pickle.load, you get that first object that was stored. That gets stored in ins. Uh, and then uh, the second pickle.load will, will get stored in, in outs. And, and what's nice is they, we, we preserve the, the typing here. And, and we can store arbitrary things in pickle files, uh, including uh, objects. In fact, our NumPy arrays are indeed objects. So let's bring uh, that data in. And let's go ahead and make use of our, of our scatterplot uh, function just to see what the data look like. So here, I've, it's artificially generated, as I said before. Uh, what I ended up doing was just creating essentially uh, five different Gaussians, uh, two, two positives and two negatives. The reds are shown in, in positive here. I explicitly wanted something where, where the, the red, the, the positives were discontinuous. And in particular, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, why I made this particular choice. All right, so let's go ahead and build a, a linear uh, classifier here. So this is, uh, when we call SVC, we get to specify what kernel we're going to be using. 
And for now, we'll use a linear. We get to choose this regularization parameter, and I'll, the default, is, if you don't choose it, is one. I'll go ahead and set it to one for right now. And, and remember that support vector machine classification, these are actually, uh, these are actually boundaries that we're judging membership uh, in the positive or the negative class uh, with. Uh, so there, there really isn't built into support vector machines a notion of probability, um, but we can add some uh, extra wrappers around the, the models that we learn in order to compute something that looks like probability. And by setting this, this probability property to true, uh, that tells the SVC object to go ahead and, and uh, prepare those internal data structures. So there's our, our classifier. And let's make a little bit more room here. Once we build that classifier, let's, let's grab a set of predictions. And I'm going to go ahead and use crossval predict. So we're actually looking at uh, independent data here. And we'll do uh, 10 folds of that crossval predict. And then on top of that, let's go ahead and pull out the confusion matrix. and we'll print it out. So, so again, uh, by default, uh, cross-valve predict is just going to uh, call predict on each one of the validation folds and return those all composed to, together. So we're going to end up with uh, binary uh, labels here. So we can uh, compute a confusion matrix directly out of that. So that does not cost very much time. Um, but what you'll notice is that uh, our model is labeling everything with this, with, even though we have 300 uh, negative examples and 200 positive examples, our model is labeling everything as a, a negative case. So let's, just for fun, let's go ahead and look at our scatter plot. But it's not going to be terribly exciting. And so there, so there it is. So comparing this plot against the data that we that we uh, brought in for training purposes, we're we're not uh, our, our model is not doing very well, and the reason for this is that it is there is no way to draw a single line across this uh, space that separates the positives from the negatives, and and that was by design. Okay, let me make a little bit more room here. Let's go ahead and compute a set of probabilities so we can get a little bit better picture of what these classifiers are capable of. So we're going to use crossval predict again. And we'll ask for 10 fold uh, cross validation here. But you can also specify what evaluation metric you want, what, what prediction method metric you want. And I, we can explicitly ask for these probabilities. Um, you can only ask for these probabilities if you've set the uh, the probability property here to true. That forces the the model to do more work during the learning process, um, but that's that's the price that we end up paying. As it as it turns out, the way I've actually set things up, we're actually going to get the probability of being in the negative class out of this, and so I'm going to go ahead and flip the sign here. So, so we get probability of being in the positive class. Now, when we execute cross-val predict again, we're going to do another 10 folds of cross-validation, so training 10 different models and, and doing validation on 10 different models. Um, but it actually goes relatively quickly. All right, so let's look at what our model generates from the probability perspective. Oops, have to spell outs right. And there we go. So there's our, our confusion matrix from the probability perspective. It can be different. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Here is our, our log loss. 
And here's our area under the curve. We've got our ROC curve down below. Um, here's our FPR versus TPR cumulative distribution. And you can see those are right on top of each other. So we don't expect our ROC curve to be uh, all that uh, interesting. So, so our model here has failed quite dramatically. Uh, if we change our regularization parameter, I'm gonna move that up a little bit. We can uh, see how that performs. Um, for the linear model, that's, it's gonna take a little bit of time to execute this. Let's go ahead and look at the scatter plot again. And, and you'll see we're still, our confusion matrix and our scatter plot are, are still indicating the same, uh, the same results. And from the probability perspective, we'll get something very similar as well. Uh, and that will take another 10 or 15 seconds more to compute here. Okay, so it finished up. You'll notice that the confusion matrix is, is a little bit different than, than before. Uh, keep in mind that this training process uh, is independent of the prior training process. So, so we can get slightly different answers. Our AUC has gone up just a tiny bit, so we got a little bit lucky. You'll notice there is a small region here where our true positive rate goes above our false positive rate. Um, actually, we get a little bit here and we get a little bit on, on this end as well. But for the most part, those two distributions are sitting right on top of each other. And the, uh, the ROC curve also reflects this. Okay, so, so linear model clearly doesn't do much for us. So let's go ahead and, and uh, try out the, uh, the polynomial kernel. I'm going to just steal this code here. So we're gonna shift over to a polynomial kernel. And when we do that, we get to specify what our degree is going to be. I'm gonna spec specify a two here. And the polynomial kernel, as well as the Gaussian kernel, have another parameter uh, called gamma. If you go back to the math of uh, at least the Gaussian kernel, the, the, that ga gamma parameter explicitly shows up in, in what I was writing. You, so, it, so it is a, a scalar float um, here by setting it to auto. What it's doing is trying to make a, a, a good uh, guess as to what that gamma ought to be. And it has to do with the dimensionality of the input feature space plus uh, the, the degree that you're asking for here. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, execute this. That'll take a, a moment to execute. Okay, so there's our, our confusion matrix. It's a, a, lot of it, a lot more interesting than, than we had before. We're, again, with those confu that confusion matrix, we really want a lot of our mass down the diagonal here, and we want little mass on, on the off diagonal. We're achieving this to some degree, but it still uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. But let's look at what, uh, what the model ended up producing. Now, one thing to remember about uh, the predictions here is that they're the result of 10 different models. So we've, we've built a model, passed a validation set through that model, we get a set of labels for that, and then we build a new model, do the same thing, et cetera, and those have all been appended together. And, uh, and, and, it's, and this is the reason why we're seeing two different piles of uh, positive uh, labels here. This this one here and uh, and this one here. Um, those come from just different models. If we were to separate those out, uh, you you could see that that's uh, what's happening. But what we really want is a a single model that can actually reflect our entire uh, distribution. In particular, that the, the fact that our positives are discontinuous from from one another. Let's go ahead and compute the probabilistic predictions here. And there's some other stuff that I've added into the, the code here. Um, to, so here I'm flipping from predicting the occurrence of negatives versus, the, uh, versus positives here. Um, here I'm uh, taking our probabilities and uh, ex explicitly turning them into crisp decisions based on that 0.5 threshold and, and computing a confusion matrix. And it's, it's very similar to the confusion matrix that we saw just a, a moment ago. 
a little bit different. Uh, and and that's, that's to be expected. But then let's also look at our probabilistic based uh, statistics here. So you'll notice that our AUC actually is up to almost 0.7, which is quite impressive. Um, and uh, there's our TPR and FPR accumulated distributions. So there's, now there's a nice region where there's a, a serious difference between the trues and, and the, the falses. And, and finally, here is our ROC curve. And, and, that, and that 0.7 AUC is, is actually starting to get to be a, a, a respectable uh, metric for that. So this was the case where we were using uh, C of one. Let's try a C of 10. See if we get anything uh, slightly different there. Go ahead and compute all of those things. So, so first we're going to compute that model with just the crisp decision surfaces and then compute the, the statistics for our uh, probabilities, our, our model to, that generates the, the probabilistic uh, predictions. And that will take a second. All right, that, that took a little bit longer. That was about uh, 20, 30 seconds there. Uh, just to compute the crisp boundaries, uh, you'll see here's our resulting confusion matrix, and that's really not all that much different than what we saw before. Uh, and looking at our scatter plot of our predictions, the, we're not seeing anything seriously uh, different in, in those cases. All right, that took another 30 seconds for our uh, probabilities to be uh, generated. Our AUC hasn't, hasn't really changed uh, in a serious way. Uh, there's our TPR and FPR uh, curves. Those look very similar in shape. And likewise, our ROC curve uh, looks very similar. So for this particular problem, changing that regularization parameter probably doesn't help all that much. Now there is one other parameter that we can uh, play with in our model definition, and that is our degree here. So let's go from uh, quadratic up to cubic just for fun. I'm gonna set C back down to one since that's going to be a little bit easier to compute. We'll start that running. And that will take a moment as well. All right, that took another 30 seconds for our uh, probabilities to be uh, generated. Our AUC hasn't, hasn't really changed uh, in a serious way. Uh, there's our TPR and FPR uh, curves. Those look very similar in shape. And likewise, our ROC curve uh, looks very similar. So for this particular problem, changing that regularization parameter probably doesn't help all that much. Now there is one other parameter that we can uh, play with in our model definition, and that is our degree here. So let's go from uh, quadratic up to cubic just for fun. I'm gonna set C back down to one since that's going to be a little bit easier to compute. We'll start that running. And that will take a moment as well. All right, that execution took about uh, three or four minutes. And, uh, and what we can see from the confusion matrix is that things haven't changed a whole lot. And panning down to the scatter plot of, of labels, um, you'll notice this area here is now being all labeled as negative, but you can see that we've got a couple of points down here that got labeled as uh, positives, as well as this blob here that we had originally. So, so we, things haven't, performance overall hasn't changed very much. The, the actual behavior has uh, changed a, a tiny bit, but still it's not really a very desirable type of result. Doing our other cross-validation uh, actually took about five or six minutes. Um, again, the confusion matrix hasn't changed very much. Our AUC has gone up a little bit. We were at 0.7 uh, before. Uh, there, here's what our cumulative distributions uh, look like. Right here are two cumulative uh, distributions. Our Komogorov-Shmirnov distance, which is the max of the green line, is now up to about 0.4. It looks like it's probably this, this point right here that is the biggest distinction between our false positive rate and our true positive rate. 
So, so that's uh, quite positive. Here's what our, uh, our uh, ROC curve uh, looks like. And you can, you can see that there's this nice uh, distinction here, which corresponds to this region up in our cumulative distributions. And then, then the two curves kind of come back together and then they separate again. So that's, what, what, that's that first piece and here's our, the, the second piece there. And again, the, the area under this curve is now at 0 0.74, 0 0.75 or so, which, which is an improvement. We end up spending a, a lot more on the computational side uh, to get here, but that's not so bad. Um, if we were to spend some more time playing with the uh, hyperparameters, we could probably do better computationally, maybe squeak out a little bit better performance as well. But let's, uh, let's look at a different kernel here. I've already set up the code. Uh, here we're using the RBF kernel. RBF stands for radial basis function. It is the shape of a Gaussian distribution. Uh, it, the, it's, it's just that it, the integral doesn't integrate to one, so it's not technically a, a probability distribution, uh, but, but it does have the same shape as a Gaussian. So it also has a, the gamma hyperparameter that controls the width of these Gaussian kernels. And in this case, I'm asking the algorithm to make a good guess. So let's go ahead and, and compute this. And it's, it'll, uh, it's gonna print out the confusion matrix. And, and there we go. So to, there was no pause there within less than a second. It actually did the full 10 folds of cross validation. So that's a, a big improvement over our polynomial kernels. And you'll notice the other big thing is that our confusion matrix, most of our mass is down the diagonal and very little is on the off diagonal. So that's, that, that means we're doing quite well. All right, let's go ahead and do our cross validation with our probabilities. Our confusion matrix hasn't changed. In fact, it did not change at all. So that's a good sign. And now let's look at our probability uh, statistics. So, so look at the difference in the cumulative distributions between the true positive rate and the false positive rate. That's, that's awesome. Uh, and, and our KS distance now is, is hitting at about this, this threshold here, looks to be about the max, and that's a, a 0.87 or so, it looks like, 0 0.86, 0 0.87. So, so that's a big improvement over what we uh, saw before. Now let's look at that ROC curve. So, there's, so there is our ROC curve. That area under the curve got printed out up here. It is 0 0.96. Five, um, so so it's darn near close to perfect. Something that I did not do was was actually print out the uh, show you the scatter plot. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is going to be the scatter plot based on the the predictions from uh, the the probabilities, but but the there's not going to be much difference between this and, and the other set of uh, predictions, the, the direct predictions from the SVC. So, so there you go. So that's, so that's our, our scatter plot. And now it's actually hitting our positives in the regions that we actually expected. Let's, uh, let's ask what the actual scatter plot should look like so that we can do a comparison. So there's our actual scatter plot. And you, and you notice that there is a little bit of mixing uh, in in the samples, and and those are the those are the ones in the confusion matrix that cor correspond to the off diagonal uh, elements. So there's some green ones in in the bulk of the this this red area here, and likewise in the red area here, there are a few green ones. There's a green one here, sort of encroaching into what we might consider the green region. Once we actually ask the SVC to give us nice, uh, to, to actually do the predictions, you can see that there's a very distinct boundary. There's a little bit of a difference right there where we kind of walk around uh, this area here, but otherwise there's a pretty good boundary around uh, these, uh, uh, the, b between the red and the green, and it's a very low dimensional boundary. Likewise, likewise here, there's a very, very nice, uh, uh, ellipse that I could draw around the reds. So, so this was this was without really any serious tuning. We could set our our C up to uh, up to ten, just just to see what happens. So let's do that. 
things have gotten a little bit worse for our confusion matrix. And now our AUC is at 0.94, so, so things have changed a, just a little bit uh, from, from before. Um, but the overall shape has not uh, has not changed. The story hasn't changed. And and in fact, as as we continue to increase that C parameter, the performance is going to continue to uh, to drop off. So let's look at that scatter plot. Visually, there's not really much uh, of a difference here. You'll notice that there are a few a few reds now that are sort of internal for the predictions. Again, remember that. Uh, these predictions are based on 10 different models. So, so the boundaries are a little bit different from, uh, from one uh, set of samples to the next. Our RBF kernel did quite well. Let's look back at the math real quick uh, just so that we understand why it was working so well. Here's the kernel function for our RBF, or you'll also see Gaussian kernel. There's our gamma parameter there that controls the width of this uh, Gaussian. And what's going on here, so, so remember that x1 and x2, these are two different feature vectors corresponding to two different samples. One might be a training set element and the other might be a query element or they might both be training set elements. But the, the first thing that we're doing is that we're computing a uh, a difference between these two vectors. And, and so we're getting a notion of how close they are. And then this inner product, if you, if you recall, an inner product of, of uh, a vector with itself, you're computing the squared magnitude of that vector. So, so that's giving us yeah, squared magnitude of the differences. So when, when uh, x1 and x2 are, ver are the same, so they're very similar, then, then this term up here, uh, th this, the difference is going to be uh, essentially a zero vector uh, transposed and multiplied uh, with a zero vector. So that's going to give us a zero, and e to the zero is one. So this is going to give us a, a k of uh, approximately one. And, and then as x1 and x2 get further and further apart from one another, those are going to drop off, uh, k is going to drop off uh, exponentially toward zero. So as x1 and x2 uh, become different, Uh, k approaches zero. So, so what this particular kernel is asking uh, is how similar our points are in the the feature space, and when they're very close to each other, then uh, then they get to say a lot more about what the label ought to be for say a query point. So, so in this case, say x1 could be any one of the training set elements and x2 is a query point. When x2 is very similar to, uh, to some of the training set points, their k is one and, and in some sense they get to vote uh, a lot for what the predicted label ought to be for the query point. Whereas uh, if, if uh, x2 is very different from some of the training set elements, then uh, k is going to be zero or very near to zero. And in those cases, because the training set elements are so different in, in their feature space uh, representation from the query point, they get to vote uh, not at all or very little for what the label ought to be for the query point. So, so RBF kernels in general are all about forming uh, neighborhoods, and that and that's why uh, we actually do so so well in this particular problem. So, in this case, when I set up the problem, I had two different regions that were going to be positive regions, and uh, areas in between that are considered uh, negative. 
with the Gaussian kernel, um, when I do a query, say, of this point here, it's the, the important points are those that are sitting right in the neighborhood. And, and so it becomes very easy for us to identify these uh, larger regions as uh, being uh, positive and distinct from uh, sets of points that are somewhat further away, not too far, but somewhat further away. Co this compares against the other kernels that we've been looking at, the linear kernel and the polynomial kernel, that want to explicitly draw um, linear or polynomial boundaries within the space that the, the feature space that we're working in, and uh, this for this particular problem, I constructed it such that neither of those would perform all that well. So, so the overall message is, depending upon the kind of problem that you're working in, you're going to be making a different uh, decision about what the kernel is and what the parameters are. Uh, the, the choice of kernel is yet another hyperparameter choice if we're doing a full up search for appropriate hyperparameters. But sometimes uh, you actually know going ahead, going into the problem ahead of time, nominally what the, the problem looks like, and you can be a little bit smarter about making the, the appropriate choice of kernel. And, and so in general, when you are faced with a new problem, you should be spending a lot of time looking at your data to get a sense of uh, what it actually looks like, what it, the properties are of uh, the, the feature space, what are the properties of the problem that you're trying to solve, and that's going to give you some guidance as to what kinds of choices you ought to be making about what models to use, what hyperparameters to use. Of course, once you've narrowed down the possibilities, you're still probably going to be uh, doing a variety of comparisons of different hyperparameter sets and different models, but by uh, by reducing the, the set of possibilities down, that gives us a much, uh, it, it allows us to use our computation time much more efficiently, and it uh, puts those, uh, those charlatans at, at bay a, a little bit, and, and we definitely want to be keeping away from, from them. All right, so, so we've talked at this point about uh, classification. So I didn't show you the playing that I was doing with the baby data set and the support vector machines, you're certainly welcome to go back and, and look at that. Uh, in, in what uh, I tried, things did not work out so well. And fundamentally, that, that comes down to the fact that in the baby data set where we're recognizing different kinds of uh, actions, it, the, the positive classes and the neg negative classes are so overlapping that the support vector machines with their desire to have hard boundaries, really didn't know what to do with the data set. All right, so, so next up, we're going to talk a little bit about support vector regression, and then we'll, we'll finish off with, with uh, support vector topic and move on to our next topic.